now recording. All right. Welcome. Okay. If, yeah. Welcome, everyone. Christoph, welcome. Thanks for yeah. heading this up. Yes. So I have just proposed to read a relatively simple and relatively unproblematic psalm. Um, for this time, after the two quite um, academic uh, readings uh, of last time when I was in Africa. Now I'm back in Switzerland and um, we just want to read and I propose that we read the verse not just once, but maybe twice or three times if people like to read. Uh, because I think that reading, even if it's not very um, habitual for you to do so, to read out the text loud, um, it just uh, is a good exercise. So um, verse one, is there anybody who would like to read verse one to start with? I, I could start. Yeah, please do so. Mizmor le David, bevar ho mi pne av jalom beno. Mizmor le David, bevar ho mi pne av jalom beno. Thank you, Andre. It's bevar ho because this is the eternal trap of uh, the comets that needs to be pronounced as an O in a, um, in a closed, unaccentuated um, syllable. And it's typical for a um, infinitive with a suffix that uh, it's written like this and uh, it's pronounced vorho and not barho. But that's just uh, the eternal same trap for everybody. Uh, thank you for reading. That's very well read. Is there somebody else who would like to read that verse again? Yeah, how about I'll give it a try. Yeah, do so, please. Miss Morle David be vorho mipene of Shalom Beno. Thank you. Very well read. Um, this is not uh, part of the proper text of the psalm, but it's the first subscription of all these psalm subscriptions. Interesting in this uh, psalm, the Greek and the Hebrew subscriptions are about identical, which is not always the case. Uh, often the Greek uh, has information that the Hebrew does not, but uh, this time, you have a Kalk translation. Okay, uh, anybody who would like to go and translate? Um, a, psalm, a psalm according to David or a psalm with reference to David? I don't know how you translate the la. Uh, I guess we would say in English, a psalm of David. Um, when he, uh, in his fleeing from before uh, uh, Absalom or Absalom, uh, his son. Yes, exactly. Uh, Le David, um, it's kind of pious tradition that Le David has to be translated by of David and that's a psalm he has written. It is possible. But Le David can mean a lot of things, and uh, it can be attributed to, it can be in honor of, it can be all kinds of things. Here, with the rest of the subscription, it makes sense that, um, to me, it makes sense that Le David, in this case, is a rather of David or to David when he fled a thing that is coming from one of his friends uh, for his honor while he's still alive, because it's happened when he flees. And that doesn't make sense if it's like a hundred years after that. But anyway, um, uh, it's uh, interesting that the preposition le and b can have all sorts of meanings. Um, uh, you, in my country, we have a lot of mountains and you uh, go up a mountain and you're up on a mountain. And um, 
In Hebrew, you can be Bahar Adonai. And for me, that's inside the mountain. For my idea, B is inside, <laughs> but it is not always inside B. And L also can have all kinds of meanings, but you know that. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I don't think there is much to say um, about the, is there a question about this verse? Mm -hmm. There is a question all translation consultants have to think about, which is, do we translate those um, inscriptions or do we not translate them? There is an English American tradition to have Psalms without the subscription in the Bibles, which then um, does change the numbering. And it's a French and um, well, also Hebrew tradition that they are uh, in the text and are usually the first verse. But mm -hmm. um, that depends on the place where the translation is made mm -hmm. and what the big uh, international translations that are um, very common in that place do. But it's quite obvious that they are um, a different um, layer of text than the rest of the text. Never seen an English translation that doesn't translate them. Sometimes or frequently they're not included in the versification, but they are translated and printed in the text. Okay. Yeah. I'm not familiar with the English uh, Bible, so uh, I may be mistaken, but um, I have seen Bibles who have left away quite a number of those inscriptions. Subscriptions, yes. Well, Commandy. Um, so, um, is there another question about this um, first verse? Okay. Then, uh, is anybody willing to read the second verse? I will. Yeah, please do so, Rachel. Adonai mo rabim, no, mo ravu tsari rabim komim alai. Thank you. Uh, Somebody thanks. else would like to go. Um, interesting, if I listen to um, recordings, even though this ma is probably not uh, the first uh, accent, it is not pronounced as ma, but as ma, usually. Uh, the he doesn't really close the syllable, I understand. So it's ma rabu. Uh, yeah, would somebody else like to read it? I will try. Please do, Kathy. As the nai ma rabu sarai. Rabim Kanim Alai. Yes, thank you. Adonai Marabu Tsarai. Rabim Kanim Alai. Which are two perfectly balanced lines as for syllables and length, and uh, they are um, parallel in meaning and uh, parallel in structure. Um, somebody would like to translate? Adonai? Okay. Yeah, do so, Rija, please. Adonai? Um, how many are my uh, Tsarai rebels? Many ro rising against me. Yes. Um, you may have seen that Rabu is a verbal form in uh, the accompli, the uh, 
Yeah, perfect. Qatar. perfect. And ra <clears throat> Rabim is a, a nominal form, but they are similar in meaning. And um, I don't think that we can press anything out of that difference that one would be in the past and the other in the present or something of the like. Within the Psalms, these forms are parallel and don't usually keep the um, their task they have within uh, prose. Ma, you translated very well. It's how, how numerous are the, the people who are against me that are my opponents. And um, ma is often used as uh, what, as a mm. question um, pro, um, pronoun, interrogative pronoun. But here and in many similar cases, it's um, rather how many how numerous are they? How are they numerous? And it's an interrogative uh, which doesn't have the meaning of what, but um, in English, uh, yeah, you say how. Uh, to, uh, the verb kum, kamim, the participle is, um, has many me different meanings, but here it has a adversative meaning. It's raise against, uh, which is expressed with the um, uh, preposition al. Al has also many meanings. The tree is on the water um, um, mm -hmm. canal, on the canal of water, al, algemaim. I cannot understand a tree on a canal. Tree is beside the canal, of course, canal. And here, al, which is generally upon, is against. But so these, um, they just don't match the same semantic field as uh, the prepositions we have in uh, our languages. So we have to see here, kum al, raise is not upon, but it's, um, to raise against. Yeah. So does anyone have a question about uh, um, these forms or something to add, of course? That there is no explicit vocative, is there, in in Hebrew? So when you, you know, here we have to say, oh, 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 Ad oh, oh, Lord, or oh, 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 Adonai. Um, it's not Adonai um, as a subject. Is, is doing yeah. He's not doing anything here. He's yeah, sure, one sure. addressed. So, but there is no, there's no grammatical way of signaling that, is there? Apart from uh, context, that's it. Uh, Hebrew does not have a vocative, whereas Greek has one in some of the conjugation of, of the declinations. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Uh, that's true. Um, and there are places where it is ambiguous. You may, f you, you find places where you have to think, is this now a vocative or not? Uh, I cannot come up with mm -hmm. something on the tip of my fingers, but uh, uh, of course, if you have an under um, definition, then you also uh, end up with uh, ambiguous um, forms. Right. Um, yes, um, uh, sorry, I, I made a blunder. It's rabu, which is the verb, and of course it's kamim, which is the verb, uh, which is a participle form. That what is what I wanted to say. There are many, um, and then you have rabim, uh, many, which is a substantivated adjective probably, and kamim is a participle which functions as a verb. But um, I think you cannot 
suck out too much of the difference between the two forms. But that's my opinion. There may be people who think otherwise. Yeah. Um, okay. Anybody who wants to go with verse three? Don't hesitate. There is no, um, this is no contest. It's just a, <laughs> a reading group and anybody is very welcome to read, but nobody is forced, of course. In the absence of others, shall I go ahead? Yeah, please do so. Rabim Omarim Le Nafshi Ein Yeshuata Lo Velohim Selah. Yeah. Uh, let's just cut out Selah and leave it alone. There is much discussion. You can read about it, what it is, what it is not. It is certainly a um, thing that does not belong directly to the text as itself. It's rather a mark how to uh, perform this text. But yeah you know, that it has been translated by pause or whatever. Let's, that, let's leave that aside. You have an interest, uh, oh, somebody else would like to read it too, we, that we have a second voice. Rabim Omrim Lenafshi En Yeshua Talo Belohim. Yeah, right, it's Yeshua Ta, the, Accent oh, is on ah, Yeshua Atalo, which is a form we will have to look at. It's an interesting form. Uh, if you look at 2b and 3a, you have a similar form, Rabim Kamim, Rabim Omerim. Both are um, part participle forms. And uh, of course, this is <coughs> what you have. Uh, typical thing in poetry that uh, in following verse takes up something that has been said in the second part of the preceding verse. Um, then in, in verse 2b, it's many, oh, we didn't translate, sorry. <laughs> let's, let's go step by step. Um, anybody who would like to translate verse three for us? Many, many are saying, with regard to my self or soul, um, there is not uh, any any deliverance um, for him uh, with regard to, to uh, with regard to God. Yes, thank you, Kathy. Um, right, with regard is a good. Uh, um, uh, <laughs> English um, escape to mm -hmm. translate those uh, pr um, prepositions that are don't match our languages. Mm -hmm. Yes, many are saying le uh, I would say here it is typically the case what uh, John said for verse one concerning le as uh, with regard as you said, Kathy. Nefesh here, I think, is absolutely synonymous with uh, me, myself. Nafshi, my, my nefesh here stands for the person. There are places where nefesh means appetite or means breath or means throat. But here, nafshi is uh, parallel to alai, the um, uh, personal pronoun. And uh, instead of uh, Lee, it's Lenafshi. Ein Yeshuata. I'm scrolling down to the last verse. Uh, can you scroll, um, uh, Drew, down to the last verse where you have Ha Yeshua, which is the normal form for that verb, uh, word? Uh, Yes. Um, 
rescue or something of the like um, in the in a case of um, military action, uh, it is not salvation, I think, but rather um, help or rescue or military um, intervention in favor or whatever. So if we can turn back to the um, verse uh, three, we have this very funny form, Yeshuata, which is uncommon in Hebrew, there are other places where it exists, but it is untypical. You have, instead of the final he, Yeshua, you have Yeshua ta. It resembles the construct form, but then it has an additional, additional um, comet he. And there are different theories why it is. It sounds and it is understood by some people as an uh, archaic form. And it often appears within. Whereas within the regular form, it doesn't appear. I don't know why. Old grammarians said things, but I think they're dated what the old grammarians said. But it's a very uncommon form. But you have many uncommon forms in um, poetry. Mm. Um, ancient forms, archaic forms, uh, forms that sound archaic. Sometimes the poets want to sound it kind of ancient. But here it's a um, context of war and of slandering. And um, of course, it's what they say, the enemies of um, David who is fleeing, there is no chance for him for delivery. You have also seen, I think, the Dagesh in Lo. And that's another feature you have often in, uh, and I have not yet found somebody who has given me an article, very a bright article about this Dagesh that comes in many places and is not the normal, quote unquote, Dagesh, but it was uh, tacked as a euphonic uh, Dagesh. And um, yeah, you have it in, in all kinds of places with all kinds of words. Uh, Ma is one that triggers it in the following word, but not always. And then there are uh, other uh, places where you have this. Melohim. Um, you have um, translated uh, with regard to Elohim or here probably from God. Uh, there is no, he has no chance to look to God to get delivery. That's what the enemies say about David. Yeah. Um, any other points? Um, One of the things that strikes me in this verse is that um, uh, several translations say, uh, well, starting with the Septuagint, there's no uh, salvation for him in his God, but it doesn't say in his God, it says Velohim. Um, and I think and, and uh, you know, if I say this, somebody's going to say that I'm trying to uh, take away from God's divinity or, so, or something, I don't know. But I think that this could mean on its own, verse three, um, many people are saying uh, about me that he's got, there's no, there's no salvation for him in um, strong forces, you know, in the sense, because Elohim often means uh, powerful people. It could just mean powerful people. There's, there are no, there are no, uh, there's nobody there to save him. Nobody's going to save him. Uh, quite often, it's rather clear that the that Elohim doesn't actually mean God. It means powerful people. Um, but I, in this psalm, I, I can't see any uh, translation that has done that. I mean, I think they've always translated it as God. And I, but I think that would be a reasonable possibility from the way that I read. 
Hebrew, but of course it's not because I'm trying to take God out of the psalm or anything. But because uh, one argument for it is that God is referred to as by his name in this psalm. And so, you know, why would the author be switching between God's name and uh, and Elohim? I mean, if it said, Ein Yeshua lo badonai, that would sort of fit because we had Adonai in verses two and four. Why, why is it they're saying Elohim? So I think it might be people that it's been referring to. But anyway, nobody agrees with me. So I, <laughs> I would say uh, it also has a, a hook to the last verse uh, that um, says that to kiriu ha soteria ubian, or rather, sorry for that, ladonai um, ha Yeshua. And uh -huh. it may be that the one speaking in verse two and the one speaking in verse nine has a different opinion. And what you yeah. say is possible that this is the meaning of the enemies of David and their pagan or, or not good Jews anyway. So they could have said all kinds of things. Um, and interesting enough, it's not uh, Adonai in uh, verse three, you're right. But then the answer, the the writer of the psalm gives, the one who gives Yeshua is Adonai. So um, even if they may have understood it uh, as powerful people, uh, the, the, the one who answers it says, it's not, it's not powerful people, but it's Adonai who gives Yeshua. So yeah, it's a very interesting thought. Thank you, Andy. Yeah. Uh, there's a little textual problem. I can't see it. Um, I think. Uh, Tibi. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's the you. thing that I said about uh, the Septuagint and many later translations say yeah. reading it yeah. as in his God. Uh, no, it's uh, for you. Lecha must be. Because but it's, it's is, Tibi. Yeah. 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 So, um, yeah. Um, yeah, which doesn't really change. They, they address it, um, uh, address him directly, but I think it's um, more logical if it's Lenafshi than not Lo, but Lecha. But anyway, it's, it's, it's hostile and it's a quote of a, of a hostile party. So would they address him directly as Lecha? I don't know. Yeah, so. Does somebody well, I think, like? I think we should say that "lo" is the lectio difficilior. It's uh, the more difficult reading to say of "lo," and so "lo" is probably original. Do, do you uh, think probably a be... scribe, some some scribe decided that it should be changed to second person because their people are saying to me, "There's no salvation for you," so it was a scribe trying to make it easier to read. That's how, that's what could, I would do. <laughs> could be yes, sure. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah, okay, good. Yeah, Verse... that's, a, that's an interesting question. Um, <clears throat> sorry, because it kind of depends on how you take the linaf she, right? Is it they're saying to me or they're saying about me? So it's interesting how, depending how you understand that linaf she, it can kind of support the either, either um, pronoun attached on here. And also it's a quote, it's not a direct speech. It's somebody who talks and quotes somebody having said something. So that somebody could have said lecha, but it could, they could also have slandered him behind his back. So there are different uh, ways of understanding the, that difference. Yes. Yeah, let's head to verse four. Who is going to read? For Ata Adonai Magin Paadi Kabudi Kabudi Umerim Roshi. Thank you, Katie. Somebody else would like to read it too?
Oh, I can try. <coughs> Ve'atta Adonai Magen Ba'adi. Kavodi Umerim Roshi. Um, this is a half answer to what John has said, but has he disappeared? Oh, he has disappeared. Um, there are no vocatives except, of course, Atta is uh, standing often in the text. And then if you have beside Atta something, then forcibly uh, it turns clearer, but yes. You have the v'atta, which is um, making a contrast here, but you contrast in, con in meaning to the verse that has been um, just uh, verse three before. And uh, often uh, the pronoun with the at the beginning of a verse is contrastive. But you, Adonai, are shield um, in favor of me. Interesting is that the Septuagint doesn't like to translate um, Magen and some others, even worse, uh, Selah, rock, uh, if it's about God, they always or most often translate it differently. And they have Antilamptor, which is a person who shields somebody. But the Septuagint doesn't like the idea that God is a rock or God is a shield. God is a person who shields, antilamptor. Or uh, for rock also, they have all kinds of um, other expressions. But they, they know the word for rock, of course. It's not that they could not translate it like that, but they don't. It's a... Uh, D, uh, how do you say? It's not anthropomorphism. It's if there are um, metaphors about God that are too um, material, material, like a rock or a shield, they uh, translate it differently and uh, seem to have a problem with it. Is it right to do so or wrong? That's the thing we often have to discuss with the translators. Maybe they thought we cannot do that for our Greek readers. Whereas kavodi, they translate doxa. But kavod is in a different realm of life. It's more abstract even though the Hebrew word kavod is more um, with heaviness, with weight or something of the like, is more material than uh, doxa. Uh, but you, Adonai, you are shield for me, my honor, and merim roshi. Merim is um, a participle, uh, which makes means in the he feel it means to make high, to lift, who is lifting my head. When I read lifting my head, I always think about the dream of the two um, prisoners uh, that are told to Joseph, and their heads are lifted. One to a high place and he's put back as the king's um, wine uh, taster or whatever. And the other is lifted up and hanged, was the baker before. But here, Merim Roshi has certainly a positive meaning.
yeah. Is there? Uh, yeah, we have a textual problem with Magenba um, Adi. What do they say? Uh, yeah, antilemptormu. That's the Greek translation, which doesn't uh, isn't the literal translation of it, and it comes from the. Um, I think it's. It's not a textual problem, but it's a translational problem, which is typical for the Septuagint. Yeah. Any questions about the first four verses or any contributions? <laughs> Okay. Would somebody like to read verse five? Koli el Adonai ekra vayaneni mehar kocho sela. Thank you, Andre. A uh, second reading. Li el Adonai Ekra. Yeah. Sorry. Koli el Adonai Ekra. Yes, please. And okay. You want to help us sound this one out, Christoph? Koli el Adonai Ekra. Vaya Aneni. Vaya Aneni. Vaya Aneni. Vaya aneni. Mehar kocho sela. Um, translation. Somebody would like to translate it. It's a bit strange. Yes. And the Greek had already a little problem with it and they got out of the problem by a little trick. Uh, in Hebrew, you seem to have two different subjects for the verb. The one is <coughs> me, myself, and the other is Koli. And Koli would ask for another form of the verb. I think Kol is mascu uh, masculine, so it would be Yikra, if my voice is crying. If it's I that I'm crying, so my voice to God, I cry. That doesn't work in our languages, having a double subject. And the Greek said with my voice. Fona in dative uh, to get around the problem and still be literal in uh, representing every word. And this is not untypical uh, or not just unheard of. There are other examples of this that you have a double subject. By the way, it's the same thing. Koli and I myself, if it comes to crying, it comes to the same thing. And um, yeah, uh, in translation, you cannot reproduce that. And I think you shouldn't uh, try to reproduce something too literal. Uh, what the Greek did is a, is a helpful way out. What yes. do you think about what the Tobe has done here, um, Christoph? Oh, what did they do? A pleine voix. Oh, yeah, sure. Sure, uh, they are um, 
Tob uh, likes uh, um, to play with language. I'm not very fan of Tob because if you buy Tob, you also need to buy Petit Robert. They use words, and I have a fairly high level of French, I can say so. Um, I, Tob uses words nobody I know, even French people have ever heard of. And then I look up in Petit Robert and lo and behold, there's two lines and this word is there. And it's uh, a very good um, um, correspondence to the Greek or the Hebrew, but nobody knows that word. So well, that's, to me, that's snobbish. But anyway, uh, they like to play with, uh, with language and uh, they have a very high level of French, of course. Yeah, that's a possibility. A do you one. think, Christoph? Do you think there's less translation loss here in Tob compared with, say, I mean, you see the Common English Bible here. I cry out loud to the Lord, or I cry aloud to the Lord. Well, this aloud is also a shift, and a um, plenoa is certainly a. a I try to, to be to, to remain poetic, and that's um, some translation get more of that into their language, and some get less. But I don't think they lost anything up uh, loud. The the loud is just a, a a way of trying to keep that double subject, and it makes with kara makes sense to to write loud because. Uh, Kara is crying and not uh, whispering. Yeah. Vaya aneni, that's the verb ana, um, with the suffix uh, of the first person. Um, you don't have many Vayiktol uh, forms in the Psalms, but there are quite a number. And that's the normal function of uh, the Vaya Anini. I cried and then he answered. That's just the, uh, um, the following when I cry. But normally in poet, in non-poetic, it would be karati. And then Vaya Anini, I have cried and then he has answered. And here you have an, a mis, um, a, a tense mismatch with ekra which is um, typical in poetry. You have hundreds and hundreds of uh, verses where in the first um, line you have uh, yiktol and then in the second, the vayiktol, but hundreds and hundreds, many, many examples, uh, which is not the way you would find it in prose, but that's poetry. And I have read a lot about these theories of what this and that and why and, and what's the reason of those mis or quote unquote mismatches. Uh, some say it's poetic, some say it's um, uh, um, um, you have to have one and the other so that you have A and B and all kinds of theories none of those theories can be scientifically proven. Har kocho, that's a typical psalm expression, the mountain of his holiness or the mountain of his uh, holy place, um, his holy mountain. And it is Old Testament theology, in psalms and elsewhere, that God answers from the place where he resides on Mount Zion his holy place, and from the temple where he is sitting on uh, the uh, holy chest. Yeah. Um, what's the textual problem? Uh, can you just sh show it up? Um, yep. <laughs> which is just a, a proposal to take the harshness of this tense mishmat out. I will cry and then he will answer. Of course, but I think 
I think uh, that's the Lectio Facilior for Western minds. It still is a question whether you should translate it in past, present, or future in our languages. Mm. And the translations uh, go in different ways, probably. So go and NSB says, I cry and he answers, present. That makes sense with Ekra as not the past thing, but the thing that I can, I may, I want, I wish to. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Whereas any other things about verse five? Christoph, can I ask what you think about Harkon Show? I, I know that traditionally from the Septuaginta and in all our translations, we say his holy mountain, but it would be possible in normal Hebrew to say holy mountain, wouldn't it? You could say Har Kodesh. Haro HaKodesh. Sure. Haro HaKodesh, his mountain, the holy one. So it would be possible to say it. And yet with this expression, we always get the, the mountain of his holiness. And, and traditionally, of course, everybody says it means his holy mountain. But, but I wonder whether it actually means, it really does mean the mountain of his holiness. In other words, it's not saying that the mountain is holy. It means the mountain where his holiness resides. Sure. Right? And it can also be understood as the mountain of his sanctuary. Well, if that's true, then his holy mountain is wrong. Because that suggests that the mountain is holy. Now, of course, we can go into Christian theology and say, right, because, because God is on the altar, that makes the altar holy. And because the altar is in the sanctuary, that makes the sanctuary holy. And the sanctuary is in the city, so that makes the city holy. And the city is in the land, so that makes the land holy. And that's all this kind of theology of holiness. But, but I think that this Hebrew expression maybe has been chosen deliberately to not say that the hill is holy, but rather it's the hill where God's holiness resides. I think it's an interesting translation, the hill where his holiness resides. And uh, if you think about the, uh, the other Psalms, who can go up the mountain of his holiness? It's still the mountain that is um, there and not the holiness is, is um, it's very local, localized. It's not, um, his holiness is everywhere. It's in heaven and everywhere, but it's har kocho. And so, uh, yeah, sure, I agree with you. Uh, I've never been Catholic, so uh, you understand uh, maybe why I agree uh, that um, it is not the place per se, it's his holiness who makes this place special, but it's the place from where the help of God is coming. But it is not coming yeah. from, from his Kodesh uh, in heaven, it's coming from his Kodesh in, in the Ha. May I add something to that? There, yeah. If I'm not mistaken, I think the first time Kodesh, Kodesh as the noun, what it's Kodesh, or um, uh, comes up when uh, Moses was on the, on the holy ground standing, you know, before the bush. I think that's the first time. And it also has says the ground of holiness there. So that would be an interesting comparison. That's Exodus 3, I think. Uh, um, do you have the reference on the three, UI? Five, probably. Yeah, can you read that for us? <laughs> Ki hamakom masher ata omet alaf adama kodesh hu. So it also it's not kocho, but it's kodesh, also just holiness. Yeah, and it's the earth of holiness. It's not uh, the holy earth. But it's usually translated as holy. You're standing holy on holy earth. earth. Holy ground, yeah, sure. <laughs> it's an interesting comparison. Yeah, it's very, very interesting thought. Admat Kodesh, the 
earth of holiness. And here certainly it's not sanctuary. Yeah, good. Thank you, Andre. Can we return to the psalm? Is somebody ready to read verse six? Or Anisha Hafti Ishana Hekitsoti Ki Adonai Ismaheni. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, somebody else? Would you like to read it, Andy? Sure. Anisha Havti, Vaishana, Hakitsoti, Ki Adonai Ismacheni. Thank you. Uh, you all see that Ani is um, superfluous. It's not necessary. Shahafti would be enough. But you have this pronoun, which again is contrasting. Uh, we had what I have cried and God has answered, or I cry and God answers. And now he comes to a situation. As for me, Ani, Shahafti. I lay down. I have laid it down. It's a uh, perfect, uh, perfect, um, or accompli. How do you say in English accompli? I always forget. Some people say perfective, or you can say completed or completive. Completive. Okay. Well, it's katal. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> right. Anisha uh, hafti. Maishana. Um, Ishana is a form that is a little bit strange because it has a final comet's he, which is not really normal in early texts. If you have va, you should not have this comet's he for the first person. And then again, Hekitsoti. So I have laid down and I have slept and I wake up. Ki Adonai Yismacheni. Because or surely Adonai is supporting me. Is no, supporting me. Yismacheni holding me. Um, Again, time mismatch. You have katal hekitsoti, you have katal shahafti, you have ishana, that's what follows after I lay down, I fall asleep in normal case. My wife says usually takes two seconds. Um, but then, ki adonai yismacheni, which is Again, in poetry, the liberty uh, of time, freedom of tense use. Yeah. And then you can sleep in safety if God supports you, if Adonai supports you. Is this a sign of late language, Ishana? I don't think so. It can be poetic but it's definitely not what you would expect in prose texts. And if you have this in prose texts, it can be a sign of late redaction or of late scribal things, but it's not grammatical. I think. Ishana without the Vav would be a, a, a quotative. Let me uh, sleep. I may sleep. That would be grammatical, but it's Vaishana. Yeah, good. Any questions or remarks about verse six? Uh, 
Um, Drew, would you like to read verse seven? Yeah, I'll give it a go. Lo ira meri vot am asher saviv shatu alai. Yeah, somebody else would like to go for it. Lo ira merivot am. Asher saviv shatu alai. Translation, anybody? You have again the al, which is hostile, against me. But lo ira, I am, I am not afraid. I won't be afraid. Could be here. I may not have to be afraid. Me rivevot am. Plural. Several ten thousands, maybe. Asher Saviv, I may not be, I need not be afraid of several ten thousands of um. Here, um can be military, and it's certainly in this context, it's enemy uh, troops. Asher Saviv, Shatu Alai, who around, all around, are set up against me. Um, we are coming up to the hour. There are two verses left. I don't know um, what to do. Um, what do you say, Drew? Should we um, read and finish the psalm? Just read it. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. Do you want? Would you like to read it for us, Christoph? Yeah. Kuma Adonai Oshieni Elohai. Kihikita et kol oyevai lechi. She ne reshaim she barta. Ladunai ha yeshua. Al amacha birchatecha stella. It would be interesting to look at this uh, more closely. I don't know what to do. On one side, I'm for closing on time because you all have very busy schedules. Um, if you are interested, we could just next time look at those two verses and go for something else. Or we could take a more difficult Psalm or just go on Psalm four or so and have um, Psalms that are not so difficult um, to understand. Any um, voices now or in email are very welcome. Uh, this is a reading group. So uh, I'm, I'm glad for everybody who participates and who brings um, ideas. Uh, thank you for all of you who have participated. And thank you for all of you who have just assisted. You are very welcome to do so. This is um, just to uh, not to lose exercise in uh, reading Hebrew. Thank you. Yes. No. Thank you, Christoph, and thank, thank you, you. Ev thank you, everyone who read and participated and joined us and observed. Everyone is most welcome.